What's going on guys, it's Bromley from Empire Barbell and today we're gonna to talk about CNS fatigue. So going over uh, CNS fatigue, central nervous system fatigue, it's something that people talk about and bring up a lot. There's a bit of science to it and there's also a lot of bro culture myth to it and I wanna get into that. And I'm, I'm gonna talk really quick about where it comes from, why we talk about it this way, and then how it kind of gets used and misused to describe a certain training phenomenon that we all experience. So I'm gonna start out by kind of fleshing out what we're talking about or how it kind of originally became discussed about. So we observe a few things when it comes to weight training, specifically with lifting heavy. The first thing we observe is that true maximal attempts at 90% and up, RPE 9 to 10, so that's really hard, triples, doubles, singles, that's kind of a broad identifier of what maximal work is. Uh, if you do that every session for the same lift, it's going to lead to short-term regression. Now this might be something that you all have experienced at some point, if you were lifting maximally several weeks in a row and you started to get a little bit stronger and you got really psyched, you were primed for this big PR and you went in and you felt great and then just everything moved like crap. It just moved slowly. You couldn't handle the loads you could last week. And if you're anything like me, you got frustrated, you took your ball and went home. That is an observation that has been seen in pretty much all strength sports. It's something that has been uh, accounted for for a very long time. And it's the reason that the wisdom is now like, don't max out every week, it's not sustainable. In the short term, if it's the same lift, you're training in this threshold every session, you are going to see a regression eventually, which is why you see a lot of uh, patterning that's so common now with regard to either deloads or certain wave schemes that kind of push those attempts apart. The other thing we observe is that the time between contest day and the last heavy attempt. So you have the contest, this is the last heavy attempt you did it tends to be a lot farther, a lot more time than what you generally need for uh, muscular recovery. So over here we have an SRA curve, which you're exposed to a stress, you dip down, your capabilities drop temporarily, and then you come up, you super compensate. Not only are you recovered, but you're stronger than when you started. The goal of training is to stack as many of those together or to fluidly stack those together over time to get the best possible result. Muscular recovery, only takes a few days. Muscles recover extraordinarily fast, but we know that the two or three days it takes your muscles to recover isn't necessarily what is required to be able to repeat an optimal maximal performance. So a good example is for my deadlift, I know that I need about 12 or 14 days break in between my last heavy pull and my contest day. It doesn't take 14 days for my muscles to recover. There's something else at play there. We know that also it's longer for more advanced lifters. A newer lifter might take their last heavy attempt five days before the meet. A more advanced lifter might need two, three. I've even heard of people taking it their fourth week out and then doing smaller or less intensive attempts to keep themselves fresh as they got closer to the meet. Now, this phenomenon that we see as far as needing to space really heavy maximal attempts out, it's worked around by a few ways. Uh, the easiest one is to just extend the time between sessions. So just like we expend, uh, ex just like we extend the time out between your last attempt and your meet, you can also extend your your heavy training attempts out. So Lily Bridge is a good example of that. He alternates uh, heavy deads and heavy squats, and then does speed work alternating as well. So one week might be heavy deadlift, speed deadlift, heavy deadlift, speed deadlift, and then on that day does speed squats, heavy squats, and then cycles through like that. Similarly with benching. Um, I am currently on a deadlift cycle where I'm on an 11 day work week. So I deadlift heavy, but it's every week and I'm doing singles leading up to my meet. It's enough time for me to recover and not go in and just shit the bed on my deadlifts. And that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the only training you get. You can do other intermittent workouts. You can undulate in between there, but the workouts have to be less substantial. They have to be more recovery oriented or they have to work at a different threshold. Alternating speed work is very common because it allows you to get a little bit of technique work done while recovering from the beatdown of the maximal work. Another workaround is to deload every fourth week. We see this in linear periodization schemes. There was a book uh, Sam Cox put out, How to Squat 804 Pounds, which was his best competition squat as a, I believe is a 220. So that's obviously a very good competitive squat. Uh, he has a very linear split where closer to the meet, he's doing a strength specific run where he's doing everything upwards at 90% and he'll go three weeks, deload pick right back up where he left off. You might be 98%, next week 100%, next week a PR, deload. And that is the hallmark of how the training is set out. Chad Smith actually had something similar in his 
a squat manual. He had some free squat programs that, that were in there that looked very similar. A few heavy weeks of squatting, deload, then pick right back where you left off. And the idea is that you're recovered and good to go. You can also work around this phenomenon by varying the stimulus slightly. That's exactly what Westside does. Now say what you will about Westside, this is a very clever hack, this is a very clever workaround. In their mind, they wanted to do the most uh, sport specific thing they could think of, which is training maximally every single week. The idea is the more often you train as heavy as possible, the more you're gonna stimulate your nervous system to recruit more motor units at once and to do so in a shorter period of time. That is how you optimize your nervous system for strength specific activities. When you pair that with a lot more muscle mass, you have world records, that's how that works. So everything we're doing in regards to specific strength training protocols, the nervous system is a big part of that. We're trying to dial that in because the better it operates, the better we do. That's uh, basically the very specific lean to strength sports that differs from something like bodybuilding is the optimization of the nervous system. So Westside figured out that if you want to max every week, which they did, you have to alternate between different modes of training. You have to give a little bit of a different stimulus. So when people see the variations, they're not all specialty exercises designed to exploit a weakness. Some of the accessory is, but the variation in West Side is specifically so that you can give the nervous system just a little bit of a different stimulus so you can kind of go around the back door and you can keep lifting maximally without seeing this regression. So it might be changing your grip, then it might be using a different bar, then it might be using bands or chains and on and on and on. This is my least favorite method for the general population because it's complicated. It's much easier to have one exercise and manipulate volume and intensity over time as you build a uh, more exceptional skill in that exercise than it is to just lift heavy with a bunch of different exercises and hope that you pick the right selection where like one bleeds into the next because it doesn't always work out that way. The general population tends to really butcher this when they run it without a coach intervening. Now, the other option is just the Bulgarian death march. Most of you know Bulgarian method of weightlifting is basically max every day. It's a brutal system. I've used the analogy of taking a bunch of eggs, throwing them against the wall. The ones that don't break are your world champions. Uh, John Burroughs is a he's an advocate of the squat every day, squat to a single every day. And he has co he coached uh, Pat Mendes back in the day. Uh, he's out of Vegas, I think he's still coaching, but he was mentored by Antonio Krastev, who was a Bulgarian weightlifter and he had the snatch record for a long time. And that's where he got that idea from. The idea is that they talk about this. The idea is basically the human body can adapt anything. So we're just gonna put you through it and eventually your body will figure it out. It kind of works that way, but you're gonna get disillusionment, depression, overuse issues. They talk about the dark times, which is about a year and a half of no training motivation, wildly different. I mean, this is, these are the SRA curves. There's no predictability from workout to workout to where your performance is actually gonna be. And the idea is you get through these, these high highs and low lows based on whatever your endocrine and nervous system is doing at the time. And then eventually at some point you come out the other end and you see this big surge in strength and performance. They said it takes about 18 months. They credit uh, increasing in the size of adrenal glands. They talk about legitimate changes the way your endocrine system functions to get you to that point. And most people, for, the, for recreational training, that's a horrible idea. You're not gonna be able to live your life that way. I mean, these are guys that are on PEDs too, uh, going through the dark times, going through the amount of time it takes to get your body ready for that beatdown to where maxing on a squat is like walking up a flight of stairs. You don't need to do it. 99.9% .9 of the best in the world don't do it. So uh, knowing that we can do it is kind of interesting, I guess, but it's not, it's not something that really anybody recommends for the average trainee or the kind of somewhat competitive uh, trainee. You wanna be able to still go to work and live your life and have meaningful relationships. It's hard to do that when your endocrine system is through the floor the entire time. So in acknowledging all these observations we see specifically when it comes to lifting very heavy, it's obvious that there is something else at play other than just a substrate deficit or muscle tissue tear down or even wear and tear on joints. Recovery has this kind of hidden driving force that requires more time than we would otherwise need if it was just a matter of muscle tissue repairing itself. So that's where we come to the, the bro dark matter, the dark matter of the strength world, and that's what we call the CNS. So I liken it to that because CNS is a term that gets thrown around, even though the mechanism of it, how it, how it actually works, is not very well known to most people or most lifters. So 
the way it gets thrown around, it's like this thing that kind of is a filler. Now it makes sense that it is the nervous system because we understand how optimizing the nervous system works in regards to being a very good power lifter, very good strength athlete. We know the nervous system has to increase in its output. We know we have to get it to recruit more motor units, to get more motor units firing all at once, and to do that very fast, to decrease the amount of time it takes to get all those motor units firing. And we know that's how elite athletes perform. We know that's how power lifters and Olympic weightlifters perform. So we know the nervous system plays a role and it's something that as you get better, it gets, uh, it gets stimulated more. It, it comes more to the front of the class as far as the attention it gets. So the reason, and this is where it starts to fit all of these observations. It makes sense that more advanced lifters need more time. More advanced lifters aren't limited by coordination. You know, think of somebody who's new to being on a bicycle and you put them in a triathlon. They're gonna expend just as much energy trying to stay on the bike as they will actually pedaling. And that's a very different experience and a very different stress than someone who's in the Tour de France and just hitting it as hard as they can uphill. There's different implications for the adaptation that's gonna create, different implications for how much recovery that, that's going to be needed. So the idea of the nervous system playing a role here is pretty consistent with that. It's also pretty consistent with why varying the stimulus would be kind of a workaround. It seems to be kind of a loophole that if you vary the stimulus, if you do a banded deadlift instead of regular deadlift, if you do a close grip bench instead of a board press or whatever, the act of changing the movement changes the neurological stimulus slightly. So now we're starting to get this picture that if you get stagnant from doing maximal attempts over and over and over in the same lift, that there is some type of very specific pathway that gets dialed in and that running through that pathway, stressing that pathway over and over and over leads to some type of decay in performance. So there seems to be evidence that the nervous system is really the thing that is limiting performance here when all you have to do is vary the nervous system stimulation and you get a good result again. So there seems to be a bit of controversy around this and you might've read articles about CNS fatigue or heard people talk about why it's a thing or why it isn't. First and foremost, we live in an era where everybody thinks they have CNS fatigue. We have a lot of information and overflow of information out there, not a lot of actual expertise or experience and a lot of people with what they think are valid opinions. So we're at the point where anytime I hear somebody talk about why they had a bad workout, why they're tired or fatigued, uh, why things didn't go the way they thought it should go, it's easier to put it in the uh, voodoo dark matter black box of excuses why shit didn't work out the way it should have than it is to acknowledge why I didn't plan well enough, why I partied too much last week, why my sleep has been off, why my psychology going into the lift was off, was I distracted, do I not like doing squatting volume? Was I just like a kid with ADD trying to get out of doing his homework? There's a lot of reasons why a workout might not go the way you want to before you have to start claiming that CNS fatigue is the culprit. So there's a lot of people that are claiming CNS fatigue when really they're not lifting heavy in the same lift every week, when really they're just doing kind of a medium amount of volume, maybe their progression is off, maybe they haven't been doing some type of reasonable deload. Systemic fatigue can creep up on you. If you're increasing volume over and over and over, there's a point where that's not sustainable and you have to reset. But any good program is going to have a deload or a reset in it where your body is allowed to play catch up and that's not necessarily CNS fatigue. So because this term has been thrown around so much by general population lifters, there've been a lot of articles, there've been a lot of discussion that's been put out about why CNS fatigue is a myth. And some of it relies on science. It relies on the studies we have available that have tried to measure and test CNS fatigue. So we're at the point where CNS fatigue, it's measurable. You can measure it in a lab and they have ways of creating a stimulus and ways of measuring neurological output after the stimulus. And the consensus seems to be 20 to 30 minutes. It's about how long it takes for CNS fatigue to dissipate. Now that is a very unsatisfactory answer given the main reason lifters concern themselves with CNS fatigue is this long drawn out SRA curve that is required to follow and abide by before you can perform 100% again. It takes 14 days for me to recover after a heavy deadlift attempt until I'm 100% again. That is much longer than 30 minutes. And we all know intuitively that 30 minutes is not long enough to once again perform to the same level. Now, of course, within the same day, you're gonna get local fatigue causing a problem, what they call peripheral fatigue. You'll have muscle tissue tear down and substrate deficits and on and on and on. We are still somewhat confused 
by what ultimately is recovering, what ultimately is the thing that needs to repair, replenish itself before we can get back to 100%. And I believe that's really where the controversy comes from. I take the studies with a grain of salt because in all STEM fields and all science fields, there's a theoretical and there's an experimental. The theoretical comes up with the ideas and it says why we should expect to see what we see based on what we know and the models we have. The experimental goes out of the real world and puts it into practice, makes sure that things fit the way they should based on how we drew them up. When it comes to sports science, when it comes to strength and conditioning, the field, the experimental is just way behind the curve because it's not people like you and me, it's not weightlifters, it's not the dozens of people in the gym at any given time who've been training for decades. Some random assembly of a dozen lifters who are put through some protocol for six weeks or the controls are usually done very poorly. They can't account for things like experience and training lifetime. A lot of times the most relevant bit of information when you're going into a study is what was your training immediately prior? There's a lot of things about what is required to adapt over an entire training lifetime that these isolated studies can't really address because they're too limited. So again, if we're trying to analyze why it takes 14 days for a lift to recover after training it to 100%, a study that shows the CNS recovers in 30 minutes after a very localized stimulus, not very satisfactory, doesn't really cut to what it is we're trying to do. Also, it doesn't really seem like CNS fatigue, the way I wrote it out here, as far as showing a substantial amount of fatigue or underperformance so many days or so many weeks after an initial event, doesn't seem to apply to endurance or rep-based things in the same capacity. So this tends to be very limited to really maximal effort stuff. That's where I hear it pop up and that's where I think it makes the most sense. So we're still abiding by a certain amount of bro science and it's important to know that. But it's conceptually the important thing is to understand when you're talking about CNS fatigue, don't use it to just throw out why you had a bad workout. Understand that we're talking specifically about a neurological phenomenon that happens when you are training your balls off with absolutely heavy weights. Now, the important thing to take away from all this really is that it doesn't matter what we call it. I'm only concerned with CNS fatigue in as much as it gives me rules I can abide by to make my performance more predictable and my contest beak. I'm only interested in the term CNS fatigue in as much as it gives me rules to abide by so that my peaks go more flawlessly and that my training is a lot more predictable and consistent. That's the only thing I really care about. So all of you need to understand what these time frames look like for you. The SRA curve for your squat is gonna be different than your bench, it's gonna be different than your deadlift. And when you're putting together training blocks, you have to know which thresholds cause the most beat down and you have to know uh, how much time it's really gonna take you to be 100% going into a meet. So that's all I got for today, guys. Thanks for watching. Until next time, this is Bromley at Empire Barbell. I'll see you.